This podcast is a quest for well-being, a quest for a meaningful life through the exploration of fundamental truths, enlightening ideas, insights on physical, mental, and spiritual health. The inspiration is love. The aspiration is to awaken new ways of thinking that can lead us to a new way of being, being well. Welcome to Body, Mind, and Soul Healing Conversations. Many of us are trying to figure out how to experience greater fulfillment and well-being. This interview with Eileen burns explores concepts and strategies to navigate the new normal of a post-pandemic world with greater resilience and well-being. The good news is that we can invigorate our personal vitality and potential by expanding our toolbox of resources for flourishing. Valeria Tellez interviews Eileen burns Doctorate in Psychology, PCC. She's an executive coach, life coach, workshop leader, writer, and speaker. Eileen Berenzer helps people tap into their personal best by bringing mind, body, and spirit into flow with their strengths, purpose, and potential. Eileen is working on a new book that weaves together strategies from positive psychology with insights and personal challenges to help readers in the second half of life reimagine their transitions, challenges, and possibilities. Meet Eileen at ibzcoaching.com. Here is the interview with Eileen burns In your own words, who is Eileen burns Zier? Eileen burns Zier is a woman who has uh, lived a life where I've learned a lot and I continue to learn. I'm a lifelong learner. I am a, a coach. I do executive and personal coaching. I do speaking. I've become a writer in more recent years. I'm a mom. I'm a grandma. I am a friend, and a person who cares a lot about, you know, of others. And really my objective in life throughout what I've always done is has really been to grow and learn about myself. And along that journey, it's become very clear to me that what I really always want to do and what I'm doing is to try to contribute to helping people move toward their own goals and flourish as best they can in whatever life has served up to them. I love that. I love this kind of work, this intention, even this realization of knowing that you are living the purpose of your life. Would you say that, Eileen, that what you do is the purpose of your life? And if yes, how did you find it? Well, that sounds quite idealistic. <laughs> yeah. so, <laughs> True. I do the best I can <laughs> every day. Sometimes I am more successful at achieving that than others. But yes, I really feel that, you know, my calling as a human being in my work, I'm fortunate to say as I have matured, have grown closer and closer and more in in sync. Wow, that's an interesting word, in sync. Um, Are you referring to that inner connectivity, connecting to our own truth? When you use that word sync, that, that kind of caught my attention. Very much. I mean, that's a great question. I mean, I believe in trying to live, at least for myself, in many ways from the inside out, knowing or or striving to know my inner purpose and really to listen to that inner voice Mm. and then to let that help me guide my steps on a day-to-day basis. On a general note, let me ask you the same question, but in a different way. If life had one purpose, one purpose only, what would that be? Uh, I would say to leave this world a little bit better than the world that I came into. And really to, to, uh, this is maybe two answers, but also really to connect with 
you know, the oneness, the wholeness of, of all of us. I love that. Uh, and it sounds very spiritual to me, connecting to uh, the wholeness, the oneness that everything is, really. Is that a spiritual idea, concept, belief system, Eileen? Well, very, very much so. Uh, and again, it's one that's that's evolved. So I think of myself as a work in progress. And, and I guess I think of all of us as, as works <laughs> in progress from my personal, from my perspective. And uh, I do think that it has evolved and it, it is a spiritual perspective. I think, I believe that we are mind, body, and spirit, and but that mind, body, and spirit are connected. It's not like they're three separate entities, but we are one in that way and that all of us are interconnected. And I, you know, I'm not a, a physicist or an expert on this, but my understandings are that really, you know, the science is more and more bearing out this kind of a take on the world and the universe in which we live. So another question I have for you related to purpose, finding our purpose and meaning in life, is how do we know, what are the signs when we are finally living our calling, our purpose? A lot of the work that I do as a coach is it draws on the learnings and teachings from positive psychology. And one of the things that has been shown is that meaning and purpose and living our calling in that way is really one of the cornerstones of happiness. And happiness, not a Pollyanna sort of, you know, I'm just going to be happy, but really, you know, finding ourselves in the world and, and the idea that when we feel that our life is worth living, whatever that is constructed of, and it's different for everyone, but that our lives, when we see our lives as worthwhile in some way, that we're in some way significant and part of a larger picture, that that helps us live with greater well-being. And also having a sense of purpose can actually help us live longer. Mm, it does, right, Eileen? Yeah, that makes so much sense. A lot of sense to me. Although I love the idea that we can kind of live lives that are more kind of, that has to do a lot with um, depth. So even if we don't live longer, but those moments, those days that we have left, they were fulfilling, they were complete. They had the sense of completeness. Like today, I would love to know, to think that if I die tomorrow or maybe uh, minutes from, from now or or hours from now, this was it. I'm fulfilled. That was that was enough. That was beautiful. I love to think that way for some reason. I hear you. I hear you. <laughs> I do you? <laughs> that reminds me of uh, the idea of you know mindfulness and living in the moment, and how important that can be, or what what a positive difference that can make as we talk about living the best lives we can, because the only moment that we're promised or that we is the one right now. So where am I? How can I pay attention to what is happening right here, right now? Mm. Because I don't know what's coming in a moment or two. And talk to me for a moment about resilience. What is your definition of resilience? Well, I, I think of resilience as the ability to respond to or adapt as well as we can to life's challenges, that we can use adversity to grow in some way. And for all of us, depending on what life has served up to us, we're in different places about that. But resilience is that ability to, we used to call it the ability to bounce back from life's challenges, but but I think it, it is more helpful to just talk about how we can respond to life's challenges. Yeah, I agree. The responses we give to whatever happens. And is that something that has to do with that inter? connectedness, that we have this following our truth, our inner truth. What does it take to become a resilient person? I'm going to say resilience, you know, and it's been shown resilience is really not extraordinary. Resilience is really quite ordinary. Regular people in everyday lives are resilient all the time. It may not be named or known, 
but we bounce back, you know, from challenges all the time. Think about 9-11 and how the, the folks in New York and how the people in this country bounce back. So it doesn't have to be fancy. Certainly that interconnectedness, that spirituality, having a sense of meaning and calling can help with it. But there is a whole toolbox of skills that we can use that can be so simple and straightforward to help us you know, build our resilience muscle. Yeah, I'll oh, just make it stronger because in a way you're saying that it's innate that we are already strong and resilient as human beings. Yeah, that is so true, right? We have survived <laughs> um, so many challenges, major ones as, as a human species. Another question, open question, is the word flourishing or the concept of that. I love that word, as I mentioned off record. So how would you describe what flourishing or living a flourishing life is and, and looks like? Again, a broad, as you said, an open question. <laughs> yeah. You know, from, from my perspective, and there are, a, you know, a lot of experts have, that, that use this concept and study and study it. I would say it's living the best life that we can. What is flourishing to one person might be different to someone else. It is that idea of living as well as we can. And there are some strategies, you know, practices that can help us strengthen our ability to flourish and our ability to move from, let's say, uh, like these are tough times right now that we're yeah. in. This pandemic yeah. is a marathon, not a sprint. What are the strategies that can help us move toward greater thriving or flourishing? The word flourishing, it reminds me of other words like growing, learning, or even concepts, um, a bigger one as being open to life. So that, uh, it makes a huge difference. That, from my experience, has made a huge difference, just being open to everything that comes in with curiosity and not, no judgments and just kind of uh, playing with it. It's In a way, it's almost being playful with this that we call life. That's what it, it kind of inspires me to say as a message. Yeah, you want to make a comment? I oh, I did. You know, a word that keeps <laughs> coming to my mind in this particular conversation with you is the word wellspring, which I yeah. love. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, tapping into that wellspring, you know, that just that that growth and development and, and becoming who we are. But again, it doesn't have to be like fancy or kind of out there, just simple, straight, like, you know, gratitude in the moment, pausing to notice small moments, various activities that can help to build positive emotions, even if those positive emotions only last a moment or two, like are in micro moments, those kinds of things really make a difference and help us to move toward flourishing in our lives. The other big one is relationships and connection with others. And even the work of Barbara Fredrickson shows that even micro moments of connection with other people, and they don't have to be our best friends or our lovers, can really help to build well-being. Yes, a billion times <laughs> to that. I love the idea of um, connecting with people. Uh, that's interesting. It's just it's another innate kind of um, urge, desire, and I wonder why. Is that because that oneness again, we all connected anyway. So that comes easily, naturally. Well, that's a good question. The, what occurs to me with the why is we come into the world of relationship. We come into the world, you know, we leave the womb, but we have, a, you know, a parent. When we're children, we need the help of others in order to survive. I, you know, I would say it's you know, that the need for relationship is hardwired into us. How do we learn to balance, using that word, this uh, nourishing, this connection with others, especially family members, husbands and kids, and also um, loving ourselves, creating boundaries and learning to say no? That has been my, um, a challenge for me. Mm, and for so many of us. <laughs> yeah, <right? laughs> I would yeah. say so, yeah. What's coming to mind there, again, there are many different responses to this, but the idea of compassion and self-compassion. Self-compassion perhaps comes first. Taking care of ourselves, being aware of our own needs, 
not to the exclusion of the needs of others, but that ours matter too. And, and it tends to be, I would say, that when there are challenges with boundaries, sometimes we might be putting the needs of others before our own needs and we can get a little bit out of alignment or out of balance there. It seems like women tend to do that more. I'm not sure. I have seen men doing that too. But I see a lot more women struggling with boundaries, with this idea of saying no to others. Is that something that you have found to be true as well? I mean, in, you know, in my own experience, I would say yes. And, and, and it occurs to me that that is probably natural because women are, you know, again, we bear the children and perhaps are more attuned in some ways that, than some men are to the needs of others. But the need for being able, for having that compassion for ourselves and being able to balance the needs of others with our own needs is very important. But the balance can shift in different stages of our lives as well. With that in mind, the word balance, uh, harmony, is that something that it, it becomes a destination at some point or it's always moving, a moving target? We're always dancing around this idea of being balanced. What an interesting question. You know, your imagery of dancing around <laughs> being <Yeah>. balanced <laughs> yeah. resonates for me. And I would say that it does, that it does shift. We are always changing. We are always, you know, growing. And it, depending on where we are in our lives, what the life's challenges are, you know, our age, developmentally, uh, our needs, our living situation, our resources, Balance can look and feel, I think, different. What insights have you gained from the events in 2020? I mean, it's still happening, I guess. What an interesting question. So I have gained, I, I think, a better perspective on what's really important in my own life. As I mentioned before, this idea that, you know, the pandemic is, a, is clearly a marathon and not a sprint. And it has required, I think, for many people a pause, a forced pause in many ways, but to think and sit down and think about what really matters to me in my life. And if I haven't been paying attention to that, maybe this is a time to be doing that, you know, and because we've had to make choices about what we do and how we're going to do it and our relationships. Uh, we maybe haven't been able to do things in the same trajectory or at the same speed we had done it before. Uh, there have been a lot of losses to, for people during this time. So what strengths can I bring to, to this life, to 2020? It's been, I think, such a challenge for people. And for most of us, the goal in life is really well-being in one way or another for individuals, communities, organizations, cultures. I love that reflection, though. It's one that I have been pondering or reflecting on pretty much all my life. What really matters? Like, what's the big picture? I love the idea of starting with the end. Like, if I am about to die, to lose the body, then have I lived? Have I done the things I wanted to do? Have I fulfilled my heart's desires? And with that in mind, I want to ask you this question. For you, what has changed in that sense, Eileen? Like, what is the big picture for you now? What matters the most for you at this time? I'm pausing to think for a second. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think it yeah. really, you know, in the big picture, it really is relationships. In the end, I feel like that's what matters the most. Who have I been involved with? How have I made a difference in the world? Have I cared for people who care for me. The pivotal question for me some years ago was a question around what shall I do with this precious life? Yeah, and beautiful. that I think is, you know, really is the question. Relationships matter most, taking care of myself, others, and also this world that we live in. Really wanting to leave this world, not that I'm planning to leave for a very long time, but in some way that my presence on this earth makes a positive difference in the lives of others. What is healing to you and what are some of the obstacles to healing? Well, healing is really about, you know, in, in the sense I think that we're talking about is, is knowing who one is and trying to move toward being the best one can be given, you know, life's challenges. I think that 
transformation is again, it's a, it's one step, one step, one step. And I don't think for many of us that we heal alone, that that tuning into that inner core of who we are, along with the power of connection is what helps to build well-being. Mm. Yes, a billion times again to that. Beautiful answer. I love your wisdom. What is like working with you, Eileen? One-on-one and groups. I know you lead seminars and classes as well to groups. So talk to me for a moment about your work as a life coach. Yeah, I do actually. So I do professional life coaching and also executive coaching. I work with people predominantly one-to-one in individual coaching meetings. I would say in, in the nutshell, overall, what I try to do is to help people bring their mind, body, and spirit into balance with strengths, calling, and potential so that people can live their best lives, flourishing in life and at work. Then the path that takes is different for everyone. Yes, right, because we're all unique. And I love how you um, have been saying, using the word natural. So you said it many times throughout our conversation today. It makes me think about natural wisdom, that it's already there. We just need to become aware of that inner world and kind of bring this into the external world as an expression of who we are. So I I love that message too. I'm not sure if you are aware of that message. It's a powerful one, how you have been saying that this is all natural, really. It's simple. It's natural. It's already there. Thank you for sharing that insight with me. And I try to share, you know, these ideas uh, through my coaching. And I also offer them through my Psychology Today blog, through my writing in the workshops and talks that I give. And This idea that we are all works in progress, this idea that we all have the potential to learn and to grow, that we can be inspired by many things. And we have choices, as um, Viktor Frankl said, between stimulus and response is the power to choose. And in every moment, if we pause to think about it, we have a power to choose our response. We might not like the choices but we do have that ability within us. This idea of flourishing, to flourish can become something that can be accessed at any age, midlife, any age, anyone can access that. Talk to me about the concepts of aging and flourishing and living our best lives. Sure, thank you for that question. Yeah, one of the focuses of my work is really to help people move toward flourishing at midlife and life and beyond. We tend to focus a lot on growth in a more systematic way in the first half of life. People are living longer these days, and there are so many new understandings that invite us to reimagine getting older. Declines are not as inevitable or as early as they used to be. So I am working on a new book, actually, that I hope to be published soon on flourishing at midlife and beyond that weaves the latest strategies from positive psychology, which I mentioned earlier, with insights and personal examples to help the reader reimagine the challenges, opportunities, and transitions that we have in our lives to achieve or at least move toward fulfillment at the various stages of our lives. It's a misconception we have, isn't it, that at some point, then everything stops, life stops, and now we can't do much. It seems like it's a belief system, it's a false limiting belief system, isn't it, Eileen, that we need to replace or change? Yeah, I absolutely agree. And there are so many stereotypes about old age, and many of them are negative, particularly I'm going to say, you know, in in this country, in the United States. So shifting that mindset toward more of a growth mindset and understanding that we may, we contribute, but we may contribute differently in the world in the second half of life, that we can continue to grow and change. And there are lots and lots of new evolutions that we can traverse 
in the various stages of life. And my book talks about that and offers, you know, a toolbox of really resources that people can use to, you know, inspire or try in order to experiment with some of these ideas. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's another beautiful word, experimenting, (laughs) having fun really, isn't it? Being open to life. Another word you use that's really beautiful and inspiring is savoring. Mm. What is savoring? I mean, I have an idea, but I would love the listeners to know what savoring is from you, from your perspective. Okay. Yeah. And savoring is not a concept I came up with. And actually, again, these positive psychologist researchers have done research, even with something as simple as this. So savoring is something anyone can do. It's really just pausing for a minute to notice and appreciate a pleasant moment. We're having a nice conversation right now. Outside my window, the sun is shining. This bite of food tastes delicious. The touch of a child's hand. It's really just noticing a pleasant moment and savoring it. It sounds very simple and natural (laughs) to do that. But in a way, we have lost that way, haven't we? Of simplicity, of being natural. I guess we have been living a lot in our own minds and ideas of what life should be (laughs) instead of being here now. And we move Mm. so quickly, right? We're moving so quickly. This, you know, offers the opportunity to pause even for a, a second, even for a microsecond. It doesn't have to take a long time to just be, you know, in a conversation, take a breath and think, wow, this is a really nice conversation or this you know, this drink of this liquid, you know, is delicious, or I have a beautiful view out my window, you know, anything like that. Is that something that meditation and mindfulness practices could help with, Eileen? Yes, they they could. So it, they're not required. One, anyone can pause, you know, and savor yeah, a moment, true. But, but certainly <laughs> ha- helpful. Meditation and mindfulness practices don't have to be a really big deal either. Mindfulness is as simple as pausing for a moment to notice the breath or to notice this moment. Just not judging it, just noticing it. And of course, and then mind, you know, meditation and mindfulness can be you know, much larger and longer than that, but it can start that simply. And, and I would offer that with any of these practices that you know, we might talk about. The change starts a step at a time. The Tao Te Ching says the journey of a thousand miles begins with one step, a 1% change, a 1% change. And then those small steps can begin to add up in beautiful ways. Yeah, it's so true. Thank you so much for what you do. And your message is beautiful and inspiring. It's a beautiful reminder too. I love the blog post that you have written on psychologytoday.com. How much is enough to feel happy? What a wonderful question. We have these ideas that to be happy, we need so many things. It's always about adding. But a lot of times, um, happiness comes from appreciating what we already have and in a way removing some of the things that's covering or clogging the happiness, that joy that's already there. Uh, You're so right. When I think about this concept of enoughness, we tend to have the idea in general that happiness is somewhere out there. And if I can, as you said, if I can just get enough of it. But, you know, I would offer happiness is not out there. It's the potential for happiness is within us, you know, in each moment. Victor Frankl, who I mentioned earlier, said, I believe that the pursuit of happiness itself thwarts happiness. Like we can be okay right now in this moment. We don't have to overfill. There's enough right here. So some of the ideas and strategies we've talked about here are part of that, that savoring the moment. Like this moment is enough for right now. There's time to do all the other stuff, but for right now, or, you know, a growth mindset, I can learn what I need to know. Or optimism, another positive emotion, you know, that the glass, was the glass half full or glass half empty? Well, I'm going to choose to look at it that it's half full in this moment today. You made me think about this idea of happiness that most of us have that's connected to physical pleasure. I noticed that so many, I mean, I went through that phase 
of feeling happy only when I had certain things, uh, certain foods or uh, sweets or being with somebody that uh, that loved me. So that changed, it changed a lot. Do you think that most of us still think that way, connect happiness to physical pleasure? I would say probably a lot of us do. And and just because I'm here talking about it doesn't mean that I never do those things, right? Right, so of course. Yeah. I'm mid-course correct. So I'll think, oh, well, I really would love to, you know, to eat this tonight or to do this thing or to be with this person. But sometimes that's not possible. So then, I, you know, I'll pause for a second and remind myself, wait, there's enough right here. Or how can I take care of myself within what I can not have control over in this moment right now? Yeah. And that's one of the strategies that I was about to talk about. You, you just said it, uh, being kinder to ourselves. That's a big one for me. Self-acceptance and just kindness. is a, To me, it's a value. It became a value, a practice, a habit, a value. It's almost beyond belief systems. I really believe that, that everything starts with being kind to oneself. Because that then creates that space to savor <laughs> this, what we are here now, and then passing that on, expressing that, extending that into the world. So let's see. I have um, <laughs> playfulness. I love that too. It's one of your blog posts you have written, the 21 simple ways to notice good moments, even during times of adversity. One of them is play with a child or a pet. I love that. Mm. We forget to be playful too, don't we? Most of the time. We take everything so seriously, the content of our minds especially. Yes, you know, very much. And that's certainly been one of the one of my challenges in life is to learn to be more playful. Play comes naturally to children. Just sitting for a moment and watching children play mm, yeah. can be a learning experience. So you know, reaching for the joy, noticing the joyful moments, or even asking oneself, you know, in the morning, what's something today that I might be able to do or engage in that could, that might be fun. So asking questions, uh, it's a very powerful tool, isn't it, mean, I love that. I mean, I do this for a reason, <laughs> ask questions. <laughs> I love asking questions to myself. How do you define success these days? What is to be successful to you? In my life, it really is to try to live the best life that I can and, and, and along the lines of, of what we call PERMA in positive psychology, trying to live with meaning and purpose, being involved in relationships that are meaningful both in my personal life and in my work Seeking, you know, to have positive emotions in my life, trying to have a sense of, you know, at different moments, joy, hope, satisfaction, et cetera, and being sensitive to the emotions and feelings, you know, of others. And also taking good care of not just the mind and the, the spirit, but also, you know, the body. So for me, some success is also taking care of myself in terms of moving and being physically active. And two more questions. What do you love most about being in a human body? Every day is an adventure. And I think of this opportunity to be in a human body as a gift that I've been given. And so I, particularly in my second half of life, really try to do the best I can to take care of this body because it is this body that enables me to live and to you know, contribute in this world, both, uh, again, on a personal basis, as well as, you know, on a professional basis. Yes, beautiful message and another reminder for all of us. And the last question is, what are three things you wish everyone to experience before they lose the body, before they die? Love, relationship, and a sense of having uh, touched one's precious purpose and potential. I love how you also keep reminding us of the connection and how important it is, relationships. When you say love, that's what I thought about too. So loving ourselves and others. Thank you so much, Eileen, for being you, for sharing your wisdom today, your presence, and that for everything that you do in this reality. Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity. 
And before we say goodbye, where can we find more information about you, the book that you're writing, products, services, and future projects? Well, my website is found at IBZ, my initials, IBZcoaching.com. There are all kinds of information and also a lot of resources there, including a lot of the blog posts from my newsletter, also a way to gain access to my newsletter, where I, which is called Flourishing, which I send out on a monthly basis. Also uh, at Psychology Today, I have a blog on Psychology Today, and one can access that by just putting my name in with Psychology Today and should be able to reach that as well. And uh, hopefully in the near future to be looking for a book with my name on it at your local bookstores and internet resources as well. Wonderful. I'll have those links on your podcast profile too. Thank you so much, Eileen. We'll talk Thank soon. you, Valeria. Bye for now. Bye bye. Thank you for listening. To learn more about Eileen Berenzer and her work, please visit ibzcoaching.com. And to access her Psychology Today blog, Flourish and Thrive, Navigating Transitions with Mindfulness and Resilience, please visit bit.ly slash 2PO0DQH. To learn more about this podcast, please visit fitforjoy.org slash podcast. Thank you again for listening and bye for now.